nuclear energy, an unfriendly word to most, but perhaps not anymore. To unpack this, we are joined by Calvin. Calvin, thank you so much for your time. So you're going to be speaking on a session looking at the nuclear energy renaissance. Talk to us a little bit more and why now? Well, Nastasia, what has happened over the last 18 months particularly, there's been a huge resurgence in interest in nuclear power worldwide. And some of it has come about because of the energy problems in Europe. The whole Russian incursion into the Ukraine suddenly made a lot of the European countries realize what a sticky position they were in as far as energy security was concerned. But nuclear was coming anyway, so all that did was push it a little bit harder. And what we have now is we have large reactors, which means a thousand megawatts per reactor and upwards. But there's also a whole new interest now in small modular reactors, which is defined as 300 megawatts or less. And they are ideal for many countries in many situations which had not been thought of before. People always traditionally imagine nuclear as being the domain of the, the Western, big, large, wealthy countries and so on. Now, all of a sudden, with the advent of small modular reactors, uh, it's open to anybody. Not only that, in the case of uh, South Africa, we were the first in the world to start developing a commercial SMR some 30 years ago already. And we designed it for South African conditions, which means that we deliberately ensured that it does not need water for the cooling of the reactor whereas the big reactors all typically need to be built on the, the coastline or on very large lakes. So the small modular reactor that we have designed, the HTMR 100, can go anywhere, whether it's in the middle of the ice and snow of northern Canada, mm. where we've had inquiries, or in the desert sands of the Middle East, or any African country. And the hu huge advantage is you can put the power source where you want the power source. You don't have to go like to where the hydro dam is mm -hmm. or to where the coal is and then have long, long transmission lines. So that is a major reason why there's such a, a resurgence now. Mm. The perception around uranium, how do we shift that? Well, the uranium thing is interesting because there's been a steady production of uranium over years. Mm -hmm. A number of years ago, uh, the volume was increasing, then it went down somewhat. The uranium is traded internationally as what's called yellow cake, which is a uranium oxide U308. And that is what the, the uranium is traded. But there's a number of steps between that and getting it into the nuclear reactor. And that is that the uranium has got to be extracted from that oxide. And then it's got to be enriched, which means you increase the percentage of the one isotope called uranium-235, then that has to be fabricated into fuel. And um, the great advantage of uh, nuclear fuel is so little is used. Mm. And for example, just outside Cape Town is Kuburg Nuclear Power Station. Now, if Kuburg were a coal-fired power station, it would use six train loads of coal every day but in fact it uses one truckload of uranium fuel every year. That's all. And uh, so very little is used. But the whole um, international trading now in terms of nuclear fuel and uranium is likely to undergo some changes, particularly with the advent of the small modular reactors, which instead of using, like in our case, long metallic fuel elements of three to four meters in length, they use balls the size of a cricket ball and the uranium is inside that. Yeah. So it's a completely different type and we have developed and manufactured that fuel called triso fuel. So the thing with uranium is it's found in many places in the world. Some places have bigger concentrations than other. Um, but the politics of who controls the uranium flow is going to be very different to the politics of who's got the oil, for example. So I see a number of changes on that front. So we touched on uranium. What about thorium? Oh, that's a very good question. Our reactor can run on thorium as well. Now, interestingly, the most um, rich, the richest thorium mine in the world is here in the Western Cape. And right in the beginning of the nuclear age, there were nuclear reactors in America and in the UK that were fueled by thorium from South Africa. And so at the time, both thorium and uranium were being looked at. As time passed, a decision was taken to emphasize uranium, I think because that was very much more linked to nuclear weapons development at the time. 
But when we developed our HTMR100 reactor, we developed it such that it can run on uranium or on thorium or on a mixture of both. Now, something that's important with thorium is it's very widely spread around the world um, in more dilute quantities than uranium is, but just about everybody has got access to thorium. And again, politically in very different places to where the big energy of the world is today, such as the oil and the gas and the coal and so on. So the potential for a thorium fuel to change the political outlook of who's in the fuel business really does make a big difference. Take me through the options around nuclear energy outside of what we already know. Well, everybody thinks of nuclear energy as a nuclear power source producing electricity, which of course it's, it's very good at doing that. But nuclear is in fact a, a very big heat source. The traditional nuclear reactors of the Kuburg type in South Africa run at a temperature of like 250 to maybe 300 degrees Celsius. The new small modular reactors, particularly the high temperature version, which is the one we've made, produces an output of 750 degrees, which means that you can use the process heat. You can use that heat, for example, to desalinate water. So you can have a reactor on the coast desalinating water and pumping it inland. For South Africa, that is particularly important. Um, Mother Nature is not going to double the rainfall. The country is likely to use double the water within the next decade as far as I'm concerned. There's no more great big natural gorges or something waiting to be dammed. So to my mind, the only option is we've got to look at major desalination. This is a solution. But the process heat can also be sold directly as heat to factories. So instead of a factory buying electricity and then turning the electricity into heat to temper hacksaw blades or something like that, you just buy the heat directly out of the reactor and you take the 750 degrees in. So there's all sorts of options. There's also companies such as Sassel, for example. Sassel, it's a whole lot of coal has moved into Secunda, but about half the coal that comes into Secunda is burnt to produce the heat to turn the other half into petrol, diesel, lipstick, ladies' face cream, aspirin, and a boot polish, and a whole range of things like that. To my mind, it would be so much better if Sassel were to have one or two of these nuclear reactors, take the heat directly, take all of their coal and convert it into all of these products. So the range for the process heat and for desalination and a number of things like that is immense, particularly bearing in mind you can take the reactor to where you want the reactor. Where does Africa feature in this nuclear future? Oh, well, that's most interesting because already in Africa, about 12 African countries have officially notified the International Atomic Energy Agency that they're going nuclear. These countries include places like Ghana, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Zambia. A number of them like that are seeing that the South Africa is large, by the way. South Africa is the same size as the whole of Western Europe added together, believe it or not. The distance from Pretoria to Cape Town, where we now are, is the same as Rome to London. Now, Africa is monstrous. Africa is the size of China, the United States, all of Europe and India added together. So the sizes are huge. And when we get people coming from like Germany or something say, we've got an answer, to them 50 kilometers down the road is far. To us 500 kilometers, you start to think a little bit of a distance. So the requirement, for example, to take a power source to where your new mining operation is, is incredibly important. If you find like in Zambia, they want to increase their copper output dramatically. If there's new copper mine prospects, you don't want to find you 500 kilometers from the power source and you now need a 500 kilometer transmission line. Instead, you can build a small modular reactor at the mine. In fact, you would build two or three or four, which gives you a lot of flexibility. So when you take one reactor out for compulsory maintenance, the other three are still running. Incidentally, you never have to switch the reactor off for refueling. It just runs continuously. So the only time you would ever sm switch the HTMR 100 off is that the law would require you to have checks, just like airplanes have to check their engines and airframes every so many flying hours and so on. So the options for all African countries can acquire these reactors. I also see that the reactors would be very interlinked via the internet. So we would be supportive of each other. 
we wouldn't need every African country to, for example, have a large national nuclear regulator. They could have a small regulator and have an, an interactive deal with other countries that if there was an emergency requiring people with Geiger counters to land together with their respective military or however the diplomats decided can be done, we can fly teams of people and do mutual inspections and things like that. So to my mind, the speed with which African countries can now go nuclear has dramatically opened up. The potential is massive now, bearing in mind you don't need the water and you can put the reactor wherever you like, whether it's close to a suburban area or way out in the bush. Thank you so much for that. For more insights, you can go to MITV, which is on the Mining in Zaba website.